Hi, I'm Leon Tarion with the Power of the Patient Project. Today, my guest is John Lawrence, a medical doctor in traditional Western medicine and functional medicine. John recently wrote Playing Doctor, where he shares his journey through medical school and then becoming a doctor while battling short-term amnesia after two bike accidents. Currently, this book is ranked number one in the medical education and training genre on the Kindle store. <laughs> Growing up as a young adult, he did not want anything to do with medicine and often took on other jobs to provide for his lifestyle. While not in his initial plans, he eventually became a doctor and completed his residency at the University of Utah. And today he will share his motivation for writing Playing Doctor and the experiences upon which the book is based. So John, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. This is a real treat. We get to do this again. And uh, I'm, I'm so impressed by what you guys are doing with the patient advocacy group there. So thanks, thanks so much for uh, letting me come on to share my, my story and anything I can help to tell your patients or your people. Of course. So according to your bio, you took on different jobs throughout medical school and you were not sure about medicine. What changed your mind? I was forced to do it. I took on so much medical debt that uh, I had to have a job afterwards. There was no way out of it once, they, once you pay to be there. Um, I, I think uh, I was talking to somebody earlier and, and, and what I was told when I became interested in medicine, because I always had an interest in working with people and wanting to help people. I just looked at it through different avenues. Sometimes I was originally looking at uh, environmental work um, or environmental policy. And uh, a lot of doctors told me the exact same thing. If you can think of anything else you want to be, do that. Only go into medicine if there's nothing else you want to do. And in my mind, I'm going, well, that's silly. I mean, come on, everybody, there's lots of things we want to do in life. Why can't we do so many things? And the reality, I think, is that you can, but certainly the medical path is a longer one than many other career choices, just because the training, your undergraduate work, and then you have to do your you know, the, the medical school itself is four years, the residency training, another three to four years, um, fellowships can take longer. So it's just a much longer uh, route to some degree. And in that time, it's very time intensive. Um, but over time, I, I think it was very fulfilling as well. So the ability to work with patients, um, especially the more I, I started working with more functional medicine, where you can really sit down, get to know your patients and spend a lot of time with them. It became a very rewarding field and, and certainly when you like to connect with people, you know, there's, it's a, it's a wonderful career in that regard. Um, and, it, and the other nice thing about medicine for anybody considering medical school, I'm sounding like I'm an advocacy for going to medical school, but um, you know, you, it's a job you can work so many different places, you know, you're needed so many different places. So it was nice and it, and it gave me, uh, I could work long hours and then also continue many of those other jobs that I like to do beforehand. Not all of them. I didn't go back to some of the random jobs I had baking bagels at three in the morning and things like that, but, um, but still able to pursue other pursuits I enjoy. Tell us how the amnesia from the bike accidents affected your interactions with others and with med school. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that was a tough one. I was about to joke and say, what did you say? Because really for a long time, every interaction was affected. You just, I couldn't remember, you know, the conversation you were in or, you know, uh, it was really embarrassing when you're at a party with somebody you've known for years and you just can't re remember their name. And, you know, lots of friends joke and say, well, we always feel that way. Like I can't remember people's names sometimes at a party, but, but it was just so severe. So the interactions uh, at first were just right off the bat. I was working at a restaurant when I started medical school and, you know, I used to be able to take orders without writing anything down. That was gone. You couldn't re remember anything. In medical school, it was really tough because your first year of medical school is rote memorization. It's just book learning, book learning and regurgitate you know, information back on the tests. And um, until I found out the secret to medical school in that first year is that all the exams are actually the same exams they've given for years. They just compile all the old exams and take the same questions. So everybody in the library was skipping class to study the exams. So when I finally learned that, I thought, that's it. I'm going to do great now, except my memory didn't work. So I couldn't remember what the questions were answered that I had studied. So the interactions were... Um, you know, made it made it harder, but certainly getting um, getting through medical school was a little more challenging than I had anticipated, given I had the lack of memory for a while. Um, but on a personal level, it was just a, a challenge to learn how to get your brain to work. Uh, it certainly gave me a lot of empathy for what patients are going through. For um, you know, the brain is such a tough area, and so you know, it's not like you can see a wound on your brain; you can't see anything injured. Um, and that's the same thing with mental illness and other things. So it certainly gave me a lot of insight into it. I mean, when, when you're dealing with patients, dealing with issues, cognitive issues, 
how, how difficult it is to understand that to have the empathy and compassion for, for how frustrating and challenging it can be for the, the person and the patient. So, Absolutely. What are your thoughts on the current medical education of our future doctors today? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed to see it changing. I think, you know, a lot of people in my profession in the country, you know, policymakers, patients, you know, have, have had issues. It's so easy to hear complaints about the medical system and you go, how can we be, how can our country have, you know, financially be so strong yet our medical systems rank, our healthcare is ranked 34th in the, in the world. And so for so long, our, our healthcare has been based on you're sick, go to the doctor. You know, and in the last years, we're seeing more and more acceptance or, you know, turning to other avenues of, of health care, of, of, of wellness, whether Eastern traditions and, and more of a, hey, we need to keep patients healthy. We've always said in the Western medicine that we are preventative based and we're trying to, you know, treat, teach preventative medicine. But, you know, truthfully, it didn't really exist. You know, it's something we talked about, but you go through medical school, you start seeing patients, you, you rarely have time to talk about preventative health care. You can hand out some quick brochures, but patients come to you when they're sick and that's what you, you deal with. And there's been a shift now. You know, I'm seeing pay, uh, friends of mine who are doctors going back to teach nutrition in medical school. You know, it was almost a joke when I went through, you know, this is not that long ago. There used to be you know, medical schools would have, you know, one hour of uh, nutrition, your entire medical school, that was it. You know, and it was almost revolutionary that in the ICU, they would consider paying attention to um, I, you know, uh, nutri nutrition status of the patients. Now it's becoming the norm. Now we, we can actually talk about, you know, doctors I think themselves have driven this because a lot of doctors are a little discontented going, you know, I don't like having five minutes to see my patients. You know, I, that's not enough time, that's ridiculous. And so they've really, there's been some pushback. Doctors saying they're not fulfilled. So, you know, pushing changes to teach younger doctors, you know, upcoming doctors that, you know, to have the time to get to know your patients, but also teaching, um, areas like preventative medicine, like nutrition, lifestyle, so many things that can impact a patient and hopefully prevent them from becoming sick to begin with. Um, I think it's also becoming a slightly, uh, it's not the right word, but I'll say friendlier. We used to discuss medical programs as being malignant or friendly. You know, certain programs were known for just really tearing down medical students and residents. It was just known how they were just, you know, some of the top ones in the country were uh, really harsh, you know, uh, emotionally. Um, to, to students and residents. I think there's been a big change there on some of the hours worked and really trying to pay attention to the wellness and health of the practitioner. I mean, that, that you know, comes over to how, how, how they're able to treat patients as well if they're healthy. So, so yeah, I think, I, think, uh, I think we're seeing changes. It's just starting and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful it'll, it'll continue and, and we'll, we'll, just, we'll all reap the benefits as we get older of having healthy young doctors. Definitely, definitely. How do you want your book to affect others who are considering medical school and joining the profession of medicine? Well, it was, it was written pretty lightheartedly. It's, it's a little bit of a tongue in cheek story. So if it can just make you laugh a little bit, you know, that's what I saw. Maybe people just sitting on the beach would read a chapter and find something entertaining. But specifically, I've, been, I've, I've really enjoyed actually the fact that I've had some medical students reach out to me from different parts of the world. Um, and, uh, and even friends who are doctors, they reminded them of, you know, they'd forgotten how crazy medical school was. But it's, uh, you're, you're going into a little bit of an unknown. You know, there's there, we have these ideas of what medical school might be about. I think we've all thought, well, you'll go to medical school and you'll deliver babies and you'll cut up a cadaver and it'll be a lot of work. Um, so if anything, I, I think uh, if you read the book, any medical students or if you're considering medical school, it'll give you a lot of confidence that if somebody like me can get through and do well, then, you know, certainly if you're dedicated, you will. It's just you do the work. Um, and hopefully give them a little insight into what to expect. You know, it's not there is a lot of book learning, but then, you know, understanding what clinical rotations are about because I felt blind. I showed up having no idea. I felt like every, you know, not just the amnesia, that didn't help at all. But, um, but certainly you'd go up on different rotations and you just felt like, well, am I the only one that doesn't know what's going on here? Everybody else seemed to know what books to have and showed up. Maybe they had, you know, brothers or sisters or people that told them what to do. Or maybe I fell asleep with the head injuries and missed all the what to do. But hopefully the book could give you a fun insight into what to expect as well. And what was the motivation for writing about your journey throughout medical school? Anything specific? Just to make a lot of money. <laughs> Okay, that's one thing you don't do self-publishing a book. Um, uh, the motivation was honestly a little bit of entertainment. I um, I would be on a call in the hospital as a medical student and resident, and this is before blogging existed. Um, you know, uh, and I would send out these emails to friends, to a group of you know, a bunch of friends out at three in the morning, just talking about the crazy stuff that had happened, the crazy patients, the doctors that had yelled at you, or whatever, and. 
um, just nutty stories that had happened. Um, and then a few friends years later said, hey, we saved these emails. Can we, I want to publish them. And, and I told them, well, well, don't. I'm going to write the whole thing. So I just wrote the whole book out and then, and then kind of let it sit there for a lot of years. And, um, and then I was working on some different writing projects, a, a, a TV show that I thought was going to get uh, moved forward in production. And it got pushed back. And I thought, I, I need to get something made here. I've got this book sitting here. So I just, um, I just decided to complete it. And uh, it's always been, the motivation really has been just to share, share entertaining stories. You know, I think to, to you know, I mean, again, uh, my favorite comments have been when people have written, in, you know, people I don't know, just it's one thing if your mom says something, she likes your book, but it's another thing when you have, you know, somebody from another country write and say, my, my husband kept laughing because uh, he didn't understand why I was laughing so hard. I, I kept peeing the bed. I was like, yeah, I just made my day. You know, usually I actually don't read reviews because I'm sure I've, if there's nice ones, that's great, but a bad one would kill me. So, um, so yeah, just to, to really hopefully bring something fun to people. I think right now having something fun out there is not the worst thing in the world. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Finally, the last question I have for you is how is medical education today preparing doctors to be empathetic to the patient experience and training doctors to listen to their patients? Great question. Um, if, if you read the book, which you should, because it's a great piece of literature, sure to go down in the, in the history. Um, one thing I do talk about uh, is how well my program um, really pushed us that listening was the most important skill in medicine. Uh, first of all, they said, you know, you, there's usually two parts to an exam. I mean, all of us have probably been to the doctors and, you know, they, they ask some questions and they physically examine you. And as a young doctor, you want to get to the exam part. You want to touch and feel and push on whatever's wrong. And they really honed in on um, teaching us in both residency and medical school. Um, you know, it's the listening part. 90, you, you can diagnose, you know, 90% of your patients just by, the, you know, from the history alone. You know, 90% of your diagnosis will come from just listening and paying attention to what you're, they're saying and what you're asking. And it's also a tendency for young doctors to want to jump in and, and ask lots of questions. You know, here's my question. Here's this question. Now, tell me about this, this, because you start honing in what you think is going on. So it's fairly important to, to listen to, uh, to your patients, not just because it helps you figure out what's going on, but they had also taught us that the number one reason doctors get sued is, uh, is because patients felt they weren't listened to. Even if something wasn't done right, patients were okay. It was more when they felt like the doctor didn't listen you know, to what I was really? telling them uh, that something was wrong. So I think there is, there's always been a good push for doctors to learn to listen. And I think um, you know, if uh, going into medical training, it's, it's, it's a sort of apprenticeship. You really learn from the people you're fortunate enough to work with. And that's something I'll tell all you know, patients, doctors are there, they're there. You are your own best advocate, no question. I mean, I'll tell all my patients, you are certainly the patient is the number one advocate for their own health. You can't rely on anybody else. But doctors are really there. Um, I mean, every doctor I know, they put so much time and effort into doing whatever is best for their patients. Um, and so that hopefully gets passed on. You know, that's something that we have to rely on that there is that apprenticeship and the best models. But there's certainly an awareness that, that listening I think that's in any aspect of life. You know, if we can listen, you know, that's in relationships, everybody will say, like, learn to listen. You know, it's easy to talk, but, um, you yeah, know, learning to listen is key. And, and, uh, and I think that that is going a lot of, you know, I've seen more uh, medical uh, programs where they're trying to do, you know, interactive models and really practice that interaction with patients. Um, and that's a style that you learn later in life. You know, the more, again, you find your mentors in practice, whatever practice you go into, and you start to shape what you think works or how you want to see your patients. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's tremendously important. And um, I know it's something that's, that's being taught and will continue to be. So, yeah. Yep. John, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and all the information on your Playing Doctor series with everyone from the Power of the Patient Project. We wish you the best and success in your series. We already see that successful in, uh, through Kindle on the specific genres. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much. It's great to, uh, to speak with you today and good luck with uh, the patient advocacy. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Take care.